Not only did Lenin regard human beings as a species of animal, he also employed animal methods to train them. In October 1919, he paid a personal visit to the Russian scientists Ivan Pavlov, famous for his conditioned reflex experiments on animals. Lenin wanted to impose these conditioned reflex methods on the whole of Russian society. Pavlov was astounded. I want the masses of Russia to follow a communistic pattern of thinking and reacting, Lenin explained. Pavlov was astounded. It seemed that Lenin wanted him to do for humans what he had already done for dogs. Do you mean that you would like to standardize the population of Russia? Make them all behave in the same way, he asked? Exactly, replied Lenin. Man can be corrected. Man can be made what we want him to be. Welcome to September 7th, 2024. And we'll start with the word authenticity, which might be the quality of being true. And when you were born, you were as true as you'll ever be. You were even born true blue. Ha ha ha. And you have that ability to still to this moment to shape your life based on the deep inner knowledge you had when you were born as an authentic an elected magnificent expression of authenticity each person is born that way and keeps that part of themselves hidden in their self for their entire life and we develop patterns around the way we are allowed to express that part of ourself around our closest people when we're babies toddlers and children from danielle benavuto you could come from a loving family without hardcore trauma and still suffer. The truth is most of us were never taught to value our emotions. We're living in a world that doesn't encourage authenticity, particularly in the West and in general as a civilization. We're proving to be highly intelligent, but emotionally pretty dumb. Each family has its script where roles get assigned, scapegoat, caretaker, victim, etc., and rules about how one must act in order to be loved get established. These patterns which get fixed in childhood play out in adulthood, often unconsciously forging new scripts that feel eerily similar to the old. The reason that the inner child is so close to us is because it's inside ourselves. It is the person we were born as, so it's very, very close, but it's not nearly as loud as the circumstances that we play in. So we play in the lit up world with lots of loud music and loud messages. This causes the child's messages to you from inside to be very quiet in comparison. So if you want to hear your child talking to you, then you have to make yourself be quiet. Language and spoken words are the laying gauge to every desire and any solution to any puzzle. All words are codes that explain our condition and mission. The next section is called Brain Repeats Behavior Patterns. Yes, as each day rises, peaks, and coasts into the evening, we do various actions, think various thoughts, determine various values, and speak or write various words. So these become patterns of association or things we're disassociating with but our brain remakes us in the image of what we did that day. So while we sleep, the brain recreates us and makes us ready to be that person again tomorrow. We de develop patterns of association and or disassociation to others and the world around us and inside ourselves as we develop from babyhood to childhood. 
Our relationship with our parents, our caregivers, determines whether we see the world in a secure way or an insecure way. The patterns we learn during childhood and toddlerhood and babyhood stay with us forever, for our whole life. The way that we react, whether in a secure manner or in an insecure way. And these patterns, if they're insecure, will cause us to be retarded in our progression. But our will will still be the main decision maker of our life. So whether our will got altered because of our circumstance, we still own our will and our body and our thoughts. So we can claim full ownership and power of ourself at any moment. Our will is always the determiner despite our weaknesses from our upbringing as a baby and a toddler. More discussion of the life-lasting effects of childhood relationship should be considered to aid society. When we learn to take sole responsibility of our actions, we are humbled and empowered at the same time. The power of ownership causes humility before that, that power. When we learn to be humbled by our own self-determination and power, we are ready to fulfill ourselves with a like-minded, intimate partner. When we find that partner who has the same will that we do or intention to become equals, then we can become equals with that intimate partner. And then both of them will feel the power of the third, which is their independent inner child. It's the one that you remember as a toddler that was free of conflict, gender, and death. The willingness to see the faults in each other as human alts or alternatives makes for a path for both parties to parity. The next section is the immersion of all in everything is real. All of the creations, the airway field patterns of energy are immersed and emanate from one source. These are like electric charges that we send into the air and they look for matching patterns or resonant patterns to mix with. And these resonant patterns are existing in everything that we immerse ourselves in, including the sounds, the words, and the numbers, which show us the energetic power of our human actions and our speech into this energetic field. All of creation is accumulation to the now moment, aggregating in an expanding and reducing format that holds all past events in a type of eternal data cloud that observably facilitates the perfect union of temporary chaos out of permanent stillness. The permanent stillness is the source and the temporary chaos is the spender of the source. One is the air or the aura, and one is the material or the manifestation. Please click on the link below and come back tomorrow. The U.S. State Department, in its three-volume report on the origins of communism in Russia, published in 1931, reveals how Jewish-controlled German banks, under the leadership of Max Warburg, conspired as early as 1914 to send large payments to Lenin, Trotsky, and others in their attempts to bring down the Tsar. As part of this conspiracy, Jacob Schiff, head of the New York Jewish banking house of Kuhn Loeb, invested at least 20 million, which would be close to one billion dollars today, toward the establishment of Bolshevism in Russia. In its article on socialism, the Jewish Encyclopedia, published in 1905, freely admits that Jews in Russia were ripe for revolution. In Russia, it, socialism, has become a movement of the Jewish masses.
The later Encyclopedia Judaica tells us the communist movement and ideology played an important part in Jewish life, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, and during and after World War II. The Judaica, in fact, presents an extensive list of the most powerful Jewish leaders of Bolshevism, which included Trotsky, Sverdlov, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Litvinov, Higanovich, and many others. The Judaica also tells us just how many Jews fill the communist ranks. It says anti-Semitism drove the bulk of Russian Jewish youth into the ranks of the Bolshevik regime. When the white Russian patriots heroically attempted to regain their freedom from the Jews, the Judaica says compact Jewish masses were utilized by the Bolsheviks to suppress such counter-revolution. Clearly, Jews and native Russians were engaged in a death struggle over the destiny of Russia. Unfortunately, the Jewish masses won. A rare photo shows the First People's Commissariat. From left to right are Yuritsky, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Sverdlov, and Kaganovich, all Jewish. In 1918, intelligence services of the Western powers were buzzing with reports that communism was an international conspiracy fomented by atheistic Jews. British, Dutch, American, and other intelligence reports confirmed that Jews filled the Bolshevik ranks and that as much as 75% of all Soviet commissars were Jewish. In the Illustrated Sunday Herald of February 8, 1920, Sir Winston Churchill commented on what had almost become public knowledge. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism by these international and for the most part atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one. In the decades following the revolution, the question became, how much influence do the Jews the still Soviet have? experiment? Although many of the Jewish kingpins in Bolshevism perished in Stalinist purges in the late 30s, none other than Nikita Khrushchev gives us an eye-opening view of just how many Jews were still in the Soviet government. Speaking to a delegation of French socialists, Khrushchev admitted in 1956 the government has found in some of its departments a heavy concentration of Jewish people, upwards of 50% of the staff. Because communism has historically been top-heavy with Jews, the Soviet policy of so-called anti-Semitism, much protested by Jews in the West, may in reality be but a ploy to distract the world from communism's Jewish past. Although most Jews have indeed been removed from high-profile positions in the Soviet hierarchy over the last 30 years, still Jews remain highly favored when it comes to immigration to the prosperous West. Since World War II, more than a million Jews have been allowed to leave the Iron Curtain, sometimes in waves of up to 52,000 a year. This contrasts to the grim reality that if even one Gentile attempts to escape, he would be lucky to receive only 15 years in prison. Jews, then, have played an enormous role in the Soviet experiment. Jews can live up to 70 years because they are mentally strong. After 40 years, every eagle has to make a difficult decision. Its claws are no longer sharp enough to hunt. Its beak becomes bent and blunt, and its feathers become thick. The eagle has two options. Either it dies, or it goes through a painful change. This painful change is that the eagle must go to the mountain and crush its beak on a rock until it falls out. When the old beak falls out, a new beak grows in. With the new beak, the eagle rips out its claws, and new ones grow in. Then the eagle plucks out its feathers, and new ones grow in. This painful journey lasts 150 days, but after doing this, the eagle gets a new life. Sometimes we need to get rid of our old self in order for a new and better version to emerge.